On a day like today We pass the time away Writing love letters In the sand How you laughed when I cried Each time I saw the tide Take our love letters From the sand Hi, it's uh, Art Fine, Art Fine's Poker Party, coming to you from uh, Santa Monica with a real special guest. Uh, and Thank you. And Todd. <laughs> uh, let's introduce the real special guest first. We've got Pat Boone. Pat, welcome to the show. Great to be with you guys. <laughs> nice uh, you look a little funny to me, but it's nice uh, to, nice other to than you that, certainly look bright eyed and alert. Oh, I, I really am in wonderful shape. <laughs> uh, it just, uh, my eyes. I think since I started wearing these glasses, they. Uh, I don't know. They seem to change my appearance a little bit, but <laughs> a little bit. But, but, but the surgery, I think, the surgery came out very well. I think it's a good job. Give me, a, give me the number of that surgeon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and next to me on the other side, I got Todd Everett, whose fame goes without saying. Actually, Todd's <laughs> fame most recently, for those of you who like Pat Boone and uh, and, uh, and will in the future, you'll find Todd's liner notes on this. This is a booklet. It's not a CD, but this MCA finally releasing Pat Boone's <laughs> Greatest Hits. We'll have those gorgeous liner notes by Todd Everett. There's some other stuff on the back. Looks really great. This record If you're into 50s memorabilia. There's quite a bit you in know here. That. <laughs> Photos from Mr. Boone's personal collection. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. so, and this has everything. Is there anything missing? Did you p compile it or just write I it? I did not compile it. No, so somebody it, else compiled so what, what it. Is mi what's, what's missing is a lot of the what might in retrospect be considered more embarrassing rhythm and blues <laughs> covers, um, the Little Richard covers. There is some of the R&B stuff that's... That, uh, um, Wait a minute, Tutti uh, Frutti's not on here. No, Tutti Frutti, oh. Rip It Up, all that stuff isn't on there, uh -huh. but I'll Be Home and um, some of those others are. The things that, the, I, as I understand it, the things that the compiler feels, and I would tend to agree with them, hold up better over mm -hmm. the span of years. But of course, Love Letters in the San Bernardine and Wonderful Time Up There and all that stuff. Is Honey, I forgot what the Speedy thing. Gonzales, you know, Moody Speedy. River. Okay. There's a song called, uh, It's Too Soon to Know, I think it's that's too soon in to know Boy, I love there. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to do a remake of that and it will be a big hit and people will forget completely that I ever did it. All right, let's start. You see, we st I didn't mean to start talking about cover versions right off the bat, but let's start. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, Pat Boone was... That's where I came in, so it's uh, a good place to start. Uh, yeah, I, I saw an interview in Goldmine, which I don't particularly remember you know, in whole detail, but basically it was about them saying that you, you know, you're widely anathematic to, yeah. to the hardcore rockers, that I, I guess you'd say the extreme right of, of rock and roll fans. Yeah. Uh, the reactionary, the purists. The, the purists. The purists. And, um, and I believe, if I'm doing your act now, I think your summary was I was a singer, they gave me these songs and I did them and, yeah. and I, everybody seemed to enjoy themselves. And they served a very useful purpose at the time mm -hmm. and that is to introduce this whole new kind of music that we now are so familiar with but in the mid 50s 98 percent of the record audience and radio audience didn't know what rhythm and blues was and weren't ready for it mm -hmm. and, the, and the radio stations weren't going to play original records. Yeah, these black people that you covered the charms, the flamingos, to a lesser extent, Little Richard, but mm -hmm. a lot of those people weren't getting play on and white radio stations anyway. And they weren't going to. Uh, so, th but there was this under uh, undercurrent. There was a surge of interest in R and B and the thing we were now starting to call, just starting, if you can imagine, to call something rock and roll, mm -hmm. and everybody saying it wasn't going to last and and it should go away and. It, it was a corrupting influence and everything. But kids were starting to hear about it and want to hear more of it. But the radio stations, there was a great resistance at the radio station level. They weren't going to play original records by any of the artists you can think of at the moment. Uh, that is R&B artists. But when pop artists, black, uh, white mainly, but some black artists as well, would, uh, would do their versions, and admittedly they were sort of what we call cleaned up or whitened out versions, of these just pop versions of these songs, 
then, then they would get airplay, they would hit the, they'd make the top ten, and quite often the DJs would say, here's um, Perry Como's or Ella Fitzgerald or Frank Sinatra or Pat Boone's record uh, version of Little Richard or Chuck Berry. Oh, or they did some of these. You, they did and they would say, yeah, here's mm -hmm. his version of that song. And gradually the kids and others became familiar with the original artist, but there was a period of time, two or three years, where they just would not, gonna, they were not going to play the original. So it was a great thing for the uh, original artist and songwriter, and usually this, they were one and the same, yeah. to get that record covered. It meant great exposure for the record, for the song, and even to a great extent for them. The same thing sort of happened within the world of white music itself, where country music wouldn't get paid, yeah. played on mainstream stations. So you had Tony Bennett, Joe Stafford, who yeah, were covering Williams. Hank Williams' records. Hank That's Williams what, wasn't going to get played yeah. on, on pop radio, yeah. but or Marty Robbins or any of those guys. But if if a pop artist would do a country song, Patti Page, yeah. Tony, uh, Tony Bennett, whoever then it had a chance to, uh, uh, to be a hit. I just thought of two arguments sort of uh, in favor of what you're saying. One is that you did do the black covers, for, or covers, yeah. very much in, at yeah. the beginning, and then you stepped out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that work was done, so to speak. I mean, the mixing yeah. came. The, well, it, it, the, the handwriting was on the way. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I was an unwitting catalyst. Yeah. I was a midwife. I think yeah. I mentioned to Todd, I felt like sort of like a midwife later. Yeah in that I had helped birth this music, mm -hmm. played a necessary function. I didn't get much thanks for it, except sometimes from the artists Wait, themselves. Let's play Little Richard for a second. Yeah, now Little Richard it. often says, oh, they ripped me off, and I've heard him personally on TV sometimes say, Pat Boone, you know, he, well, I like Pat Boone, but, you know, he took my song and this and that. Well, I, had, I brought you a tape. Uh, this is about 30 seconds of uh, Little Richard in an interview 20 years ago. Yeah, talk, and we have he tells it like it was. Okay, we hear that? Yeah, that was yeah, but that, I wasn't bringing Pat down for it. <laughs> no, I know that. I was never uh, bring him down. saying that by Pat Boone doing the song, the song got air and got across the line, which brought Richard automatically across. That's the right. Kids wouldn't uh, take a duplicate. Because I was in Macon, Georgia, washing dishes at the bus station. I was glad to get out of there. A lot of the new. <laughs> Okay, um, it's Pat. You know, it's it's Little Richard saying he appreciates what was done. And Fats, I went down to to New Orleans, and I. While I was there, I went in to see Fats at Al Hurt's place. I'm sorry, when was this? Oh, goodness, this was uh, in the 60s mm -hmm. sometime. And maybe 10 years after I'd had a huge hit, number one hit with Ain't That a Shame. And uh, I went in to see Fats at Al Hurt's place, and it was in, in the round, the way it was set up. And Fats called me up to the, uh, the stage, and I sat down on the piano bench next to him, and he said, you folks see this ring? And of course, he had rings on every finger, but this particularly big shiny diamond ring. He says, see this ring? This man bought me this ring with this song. <laughs> you made bon, bon, me cry. And we did it together. Uh -huh. And he was crediting me with having made him a lot of money with, yeah. by doing his song. Do I remember seeing you duet with Little Richard on a couple things? I thought I, I saw it on the Steve Allen show 25 years ago oh. or something. And I remember being kind of surprised. You made me. <laughs> it did make quite right. a contrast. You know, I forget a lot of these things because there was such a headlong uh, flurry of activity. And I, was but, and visiting, I forget. I was visiting uh, my cousins in LA and I remember turning on this Steve Allen show and there's you and little Richard. And, and boy, that was a, something of a I shocker. know we were on a show together in Detroit. I remember this. It was a, yeah. a Dick Clark American Bandstand kind of show. Uh -huh. You know, uh, there was a while there where every big city had its own uh, bandstand type show in the afternoons. And, and of course, a particularly big one in Detroit. And so he and I were booked on the same show. We were guests. I remember he got up. I'd never seen him perform live. And I remember he got up on a table. They had kids sitting at tables like it was a soda shop or something. And he jumped up on the table and just and went nuts. And of course, I'd never seen a guy wearing lipstick either. <laughs> but uh, I mean, he was wearing wild <laughs> hair, lipstick, and, and saying, you, you folks, they got pretty. You know, and of course, they did. <laughs> But uh, and so I don't, all you think, I don't think, think we that sang together. Can't imitate Little Richard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was wild, and and I I think he's great. I think he is, though. Everything is derivative to some extent. I mean, hard anybody can claim to be a total original, never having been influenced by anybody else. But but Richard, uh, uh, it comes as close I think to being an original um, as you could find in music, and um, I think he could justifiably lay claim to being at least the living king of rock and roll as he 
as he believes he is. Or at least the Georgia peach, which he also, yeah. which he also <laughs> claims. Right. I don't think anybody deny him that. <laughs> but, but you know, that whole thing with that whole rock era was um, a very turbulent, uncharted um, time. There was something going on, and not just in music, but throughout society, and ch great changes, and none of us, none of us could tell where it was going. Everybody was just trying to fit in however we could, and when the recording director and owner of the record company, Dot, Randy Wood, would give me a song to record, I usually just recorded it almost no questions asked, as long as the lyric I felt was not an immoral kind of a thing, and, and of course, today's idea of what's immoral and, and then uh, might be quite a bit different, but I changed even some words of Little Richard's uh, Long Tall Sally, and I think even Tutti Frutti uh, changed it from, boy, you don't know what she'd do to me, which sounded a little risque to me at the time, to pretty little Susie is the girl for me. Well, I know that's insipid now, but uh, uh, and it might have been even then, but the kids didn't care. All they cared about was the beat, the excitement of the song, you know. And Long Tall Sally about uh, I saw Uncle John with Long Tall Sally. He saw Aunt Mary coming. Now, Aunt Mary probably belongs to Uncle John. I mean, I never <laughs> asked Richard, but Aunt, <laughs> he saw Aunt Mary coming and he ducked back in the alley. Well, I had fun with that song. I just uh, hoped that nobody was going to check on who Uncle John and Aunt Mary were <laughs> and how Long Tall Sally fit into the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty cryptic song. Yeah. You, you, you ran later later in your career, I mean still sometime before Debbie Boone was having hits, but later in your career you were having problems in certain parts of the universe with regards to records, weren't you? Oh, well, yes. In Singapore, for example, as I was booked into Singapore, you know, that exotic sounding place, and it is, but I was booked and I was lo looking forward to it, had the musicians all set, we're getting ready to go, had my show put together. And I get a, a wire saying, please do not plan on doing Speedy Gonzales or you'll be arrested. <laughs> be arrested for singing Speedy Gonzales? And I found out it was because they considered that the song must be about drugs. Mm. Speed, mm. Speedy Gonzales. And, um, and if I remember, they considered Tutti Frutti even, and Long Tall Sally too raunchy. Hmm. Now, I don't know if they were hearing my record or, or Richard's, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I had to leave those songs out of my act. Fortunately, I knew a few other songs. The funny thing about Speedy Gonzalez, or a funny thing in this context, is that you had originally found it in the Philippines. The Philippines. <laughs> which is close enough to Singapore. <laughs> uh, yes, I love that story because to me this is how, this is how the record business is, can be and was so exciting. It's, all of this excitement is virtually gone from the record business, but I heard a guy that wasn't even a, a professional singer, he was a TV director in an after-hours place close to the Araneta Coliseum where I was appearing. And I went over there after the show and, and um, the guy got up and sang at the request of the crowd this song called Speedy Gonzalez. The crowd went nuts and I'm thinking, hey, that sounds like a hit, what's that? And I asked him, the people I was with, they said, you don't know that? That's a number one hit here. He said, it's an American artist on RCA, David Dante. I knew that name. Didn't know David, but uh, they said, oh, it was a number one. Wasn't it a hit in America? I said, no. And, but a little light was going on in my head. I thought, man, that's a good song. So I, I got hold of David Dante's record and brought it home. I tried to get Randy Wood at Dot to let me do it, but by then I had done Friendly Persuasion and movie songs, and Richard Rogers had written another song for uh, State Fair for me and Ann Margaret. And uh, he said, no, no, people won't buy you buy, uh, singing rock and roll anymore. I said, Randy, they did before, and this is just a hit song no matter who does it. Well, it took a year. Mm -hmm. He finally, just to get me off his back, let me throw this at the end of a session. And the way we recorded in those days, if I didn't do three or four complete records in a three-hour session, I felt like I was just wasting everybody's money. I mean, we finished, we did everything in three hours, and I mean three complete singles. We put them out the way we did them. So I did Speedy Gonzalez and it went right to number one in just a matter of weeks. But then of course I got sued by uh, Warner Brothers because they, they considered that we had taken their cartoon character and I didn't even know there was a cartoon oh. character named Speedy Gonzalez and that they, therefore we should pay them all the royalties. 
Hmm. The, weir uh, the weird sidelight to that is that Mel Blanc does the voice of Speedy Gonzalez yeah. on the record, and Mel Blanc had done the, speed the voice of Speedy Gonzalez the for cartoons. the Warner Brothers cartoon, yes. and still nobody had made the connection. Yeah, that's right. Randy Mel would. must have known. But. Randy, yeah, he did, and he knew, <laughs> and by the way, the girl's voice, the la, 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 which Elton John sort of borrowed, and he admitted he did, for Crocodile Rock mm -hmm. later. Uh, that girl on my record was Robin Ward, who had two or three hit records uh, of her own. Yeah. Well, Robin Ward, the mother, right? Uh, uh, Jackie Ward. Yeah, Jackie Ward. Was her real name, and she recorded under the name Robin Ward. Oh. That is all in the liner notes. There was something oh, wow. summer. Wonderful, wonderful summer. summer. Yeah, yeah, right. Jackie, Jackie Ward was old enough to have a daughter named Robin, and she, I think she didn't really want to go on tour or anything, uh -huh. so she just used the name Robin Ward on Great record. studio singer, great, great, just great singer, yeah. period. She's still around, she's still, she's she? still doing it. Yeah.